Thank you, Celine, for your, uh, the, that presentation. Now, our final presentation uh, will be with Dr. Diane Pennehues, full professor in the Department of Africana Studies and Political Science at Notre Dame. Uh, she is, is a, uh, a very prolific scholar on questions of race and ethnicity and uh, the re-examination of pluralist theory. And, uh, and sometime uh, she comes to Chicago to make her contributions. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Penny. <laughs> Also to Martin Swine and the Chicago Council uh, for Black Studies for organizing this event. Um, I think, like Dr. Murray, I was I was reading the book, but you know it did help me to finish reading the book to have this event. I'm a political scientist, and uh, in addition to being in Africana Studies, uh, but I'm going to focus on the organizational um, kind of approaches that I've I've been interested in in my career. So I'm going to hit a couple of points, and we'll, um, we're getting close to lunch now, so I'll try to uh, limit the uh, length of my presentation. I'll talk about um, Malcolm as a charismatic leader um, uh, that uh, Salim just referred to in terms of having had the chance to see him. I've not, I did not see him give a speech uh, when I was uh, in elementary school. Uh, no. Well, over the night. So I didn't. I didn't have the sense of seeing him directly, but at the same time, reading this book, my read made his presence more powerful to me. Um, but maybe that's because I didn't see him in person, and so that made a difference. Um, I also want to talk about him as an organizational leader to try to uh, say something about some of the contradictions that he dealt with that I would argue incorporated, are incorporated into American life. Hit a little bit about the critiques of my critiques of the book and, um, and then leave it at that for discussions. Um, and I guess I would say like Dr. Murray after the, while I didn't see him give the speech, reading the book and looking at the pictures um, made me want to, uh, I was a, I felt in love with him too as well. I didn't, wasn't impressed, wasn't overwhelmed by him as a, in graduate school and uh, as a young faculty member, but at the same time he's been on my syllabus for many years. Um, uh, so, charismatic leader. I was struck um, as I read the book by the number of um, um, examples that Marable drew upon of people, quoting from people who knew him and met him and decided I would include a, a few of those in my presentation as a sense of, to give you a sense of his charisma. Uh, one of them um, came from Maya Angelou. Uh, this is on page 190 in Marable's book. She, he describes her in February of 1961 when she met him uh, in New York. There'd been a demonstration at the UN, uh, and a lot of protests. She was rep representing the cultural, she's one of the leaders of the Cultural Association of Women of African Heritage. And she went to uh, meet with him after this demonstration, and there had been a lot of um, fallout from it. She just characterized him, and this is a quote, his aura was too bright, and his masculine force affected me physically. Um, a hot desert storm eddied around him and rushed, uh, rushed to me, making my skin contract and my pores slam shut. His hair was the color of burning embers, and his eyes uh, pierced. That's a pretty strong characterization. Now, Maya Angelou, you know, she's, we know her as the poet. We know her as the poet, but she was also a political activist. Spent a lot of time in, in, in Ghana. She met him again in Ghana later, uh, a few years later. Um, I'm sure that there's, um, I didn't get a chance to look at her descriptions of him in her, her own, some of her own autobiographies, and I'm sure they're there. Uh, Tulani Davis, and this is a, the discussion of sources is very interesting. I think um, I found that the sources were somewhat less um, 
detailed than I would have liked, but as uh, I think it was Bart commented to me in preparation for this, he has something like 23 pages of notes. The footnotes are arranged a little differently than their usual book. Instead of footnotes, they're page numbers, and you have to take, it took me a while to figure out how to even read them. But you have to look through those pages to find the source, and sometimes, as um, uh, Kelly said, uh, they, they don't show up. So there's, there's a mix of um, accuracy in terms of, or consistency in terms of the, way, the things that he cites. There are lots of important events that he's discussing, and you go to look for the source, and it's not there. I can't explain that, but I'm just describing. Now, Thelani Davis um, uh, published a book on uh, Malcolm X, The um, Great Photos, uh, and that was published in about 1992. Uh, there are more than 100 photos of Malcolm, Malcolm X in that book. J uh, uh, Bill Strickland published a book the next year uh, that seemed to be kind of an inverse he drew on text, he drew on interviews, people's comments about Malcolm, along with pictures, but not as many. But she cites James Turner um, in her book about Malcolm and about his Im impact on um, political activists at the time. But then Malcolm broke on the scene. He was the most dramatic speaker. What I found most uh, impressive about Malcolm was not just his eloquent command of words, but his ability to reason very complex ideas um, um, the comments that um, Charles Mills was talking about. Very complex ideas in a way that was accessible to people who were not intellectuals. Um, Marable turns to a, a policeman, a person who was a member of the New York Police Department, was a member of the Bureau of Special Services, which was um, engaged in a lot of um, uh, surveillance of people they considered political uh, politically uh, dangerous types. So Fulcher, um, and this is from page 356, 357, uh, is described as um, uh, responsible by early 1964 for covert surveillance of Malcolm X through wiretapping. He assumed Malcolm wanted to um, overturn gov the government and he hated whites. What I heard um, and he says when he began to listen to the uh, surveillance tapes, what I heard was nothing what I expected. I remember saying to myself, let's see, he's right about that. He wants blacks to get jobs. He wants them to get education. Wants them to get into the system. What's wrong with that? And concluded, he concluded, Gelb Fulcher, that Malcolm was not the enemy of white people in general. This is somebody who wasn't seeing the person but was listening to the wire tape. Um, I think as a charismatic leader, we, you know, social, social scientists, political scientists talk about this a lot. <coughs> Martin Luther King was, has typically been seen as the ultimate charismatic leader, but obviously Malcolm X was one as well. I would argue that Malcolm X was particularly useful because he, or unusual, because he combined two dimensions. Um, he, had, he combined the charismatic leadership abilities that uh, Salim has described and others uh, Haki Madhubuti talked about how he gave him his voice. Um, the, um, some of the quotes in the later in part of the book, one of the people, it might have been, it might have been James 67X, talked about how Malcolm was mesmerizing, how he was constantly, you know, he might have argued, wanted to argue with him, but he couldn't because he found Malcolm so mesmerizing. But Malcolm also had the capacity to build bureaucratic organizations, which is what the NOI was either becoming already or became as part of during the period when Malcolm was <coughs> serving as a builder. That's a phrase I just made up. Um, and you know, he he was in the Concord um, Reformatory in 1947. It was when he converted to uh, the Nas Nation of Islam in 1952. He went to Chicago to hear Elijah Muhammad. 1953 he began to be appointed to NOI positions in the temples in um, New York, uh, Washington, and Philadelphia, and between 53 and 63, he reached the point where he was nationally known, where he became a national, uh, nationally controversial figure, um, including the chickens coming home to roost statement in the wake of Kennedy's assassination. So in a very short period of time, 10 years, he moved from being just a brand new member of the NOI to being a leader, but also being completely 
very much a national leader, somebody who helped construct temples all over the country. I didn't try to calculate how many, but it's clear that they were very large numbers for me. Um, so now his, his charisma was obviously fused with the charisma of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as leader of the NOI. Um, Malcolm X was second in command. He used the ideological foundations of the nation and um, fused it with the rapidly developing civil rights movement and the black power movement. He was able to use elements of all of those in his own energy and anger, as well as the energy and anger of people who were um, beginning to be politically active and engaged in protest at the same time. It struck a chord in the U.S. among African Americans, among young people and Af young African Americans, but also everywhere he went in the world, he would uh, be met with large numbers of people. Um, so one of the things I did was talk to a cousin who lived in, has lived in Harlem for many years and assumed that he would have met or had some impact or had some impression of Malcolm X, but he did uh, remind me that he wasn't quite as old as that, um, that he was uh, not yet living in Harlem at that point. He was, he was actually in Washington going to Howard University. And yes, he saw Malcolm X at Howard and he talked about how um, he did see him on campus. He was a, described him as a firebrand. He said he stirred up the students, but he said he didn't, he didn't have to do um, all that much to stir up the kids. The kids would be ready to riot very quickly. And that put into context um, the fact of the contrast between the current situation, the current environment, where we have to work really hard to get the students to even be that responsive. You know, you have to really push them and challenge them um, to get them to uh, be responsive to things that they might might want to be critical of. And you sort of tell them what to do. His his point was that wasn't um, that wasn't ne necessary at the time. So um, he also yeah. mis misunderstood me my first question um, and thought I was asking about Maryland and said uh, my cousin is a photographer, John Penderhues and belongs to an association of black uh, photographers called Kamoinge. And he said that uh, Marable permitted them to meet at his space, um, I think at the Institute of African American Studies at Columbia. And he said, and my cousin is not a, um, how can I put this? He's not an easy person in terms of uh, positive compliments. And he said he seemed, he, he said he thought Marable seemed like a, a regular guy. That was for my cousin John also known as Monkey, a very, very high criticism, a very, very high compliment. And I didn't expect that, just a, just a context. Um, so I was talking about the charismatic aspect, the organizational aspect. Marable, towards the end, one of the latter chapters, says, um, compares Malcolm X to Martin Luther King and talks about how King was important in, in helping to create the Montgomery Improvement Association, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and Malcolm was impressive in terms of his organizational activities. That's actually an error. Um, Charles Payne's work, um, um, your colleague at Northwestern, whose name I've forgotten, a sociologist, um, Alder Morris, yes. Um, that work has made very clear that um, the Montgomery Improvement Association uh, SCLC, these were organizations that were invented, uh, particularly the SCLC by uh, Ella Baker came up. She and another uh, leader in New York came with the idea of it. They moved to, she moved to Atlanta and was the first executive director of the SCLC. Um, King played a role as a conventional minister. You play the role as the minister, other people organize it for you. Um, Montgomery Improvement Association, the same thing. I mean, it was already organized. King didn't organize it. He was actually called upon to play the role as leader, but the people in the, in the area of Birmingham had already done that. An organization of organizations is um, Alden Morris's concept that comes out of that book. That wasn't the case with Malcolm X. Um, the, some elements of it were clearly there, and I, I don't know the literature, so uh, clearly Kelly Harris can give us some framework on this as to how much of the nation was organized when Malcolm became a member and then began to be a leader. And this is an example of something I'd like to see more research on. 
it seems to me from Marable's book, but people can say otherwise, uh, correct me, that um, Malcolm X helped form, build, develop the networks of people, create um, temples in a lot of different cities, and mobilize different networks of, of um, activists uh, that made it possible for the nation to grow so dramatically within a short period of time, within 10 years. Um, obviously, the um, civil rights movement was going on at the same time, so you had other uh, ways in which people responded. All right, I'm going to go to, um, I'm going to skip the contradictions um, and talk about the limitations that I found. I've already mentioned the sources. I think Kelly's right um, about um, the um, issues of how much can you rely on the FBI files as in terms of them being accurate. Yes, they're there, there's documentation. Um, one thing I want to say, uh, the U.S. archives, um, copies of the um, FBI files of Malcolm X from 1995 were copied and are uh, in the U.S. archives, meaning they're online. Uh, I found them just in preparation for this. Uh, they're at the in the um, Notre Dame Library online. And but you think you're looking at the FBI files and you see a little note that says these were copied in 2005. I think it's 2005, um, and that's what they were at the time. But they're now in the U.S. archives. So that means you can actually look at them. And there's enormous amount of material on them, but there's also, each page has a lot of people writing and little notations and trying to make sense out of what does this mean, what does that mean, what was changed, what was there originally. So there's, definitely there's reason to be careful in looking at them, to say the least. Um, and to have, you know, you, need, you really need people to do a lot of work to see what, what these are. How much can you trust them? Um, another thing that I did was, I, as I was reading the book, and I, every 50 to 60 pages, it's a very long book, um, I would sort of start, stop and look at the, look at the inset with the photos, because the photos are pretty compelling. But I decided that I didn't think there were enough of them, and I also thought there weren't enough photos of women, and uh, wondered why um, Maribel had made those choices. Well, I also mentioned the Thelani Davis book that I've discovered, you know, I mean, it's not that it didn't exist. I discovered it. I learned about it. I shouldn't say that. I learned about it when I did some library research. And um, that is a very interesting volume. I mentioned it has more than 100 photos. Um, I decided I would do a count. So of the 21 pictures that are in the Marable book, um, four of them are also in the Thulani Davis book. She has more than 100. Um, the Detroit Red, um, the photo with Sheikh Abdul Rahman, I can't get the last word because I can't read my writing, on page 134. The, the photo of him after the firebombing of his house when he's getting out of his car in 138, and then the shooting, um, after the shooting at the uh, Audubon Ballroom, those four. Now, I also, in terms of the issue of women, I uh, decided I'd just do a little count of them. And so of the more than 100, I counted about um, 22. In Thelani Davis's book, there's something like 22 p photos that include women. But 14 of those are women who are prominent in the photos. That is, they're, the, they're right up front. They're the source of, they're the center of the photo. Eight of them are kind of in the background. In the Marable, um, pictures of the 21 that he included, uh, four are women are in the, are prominently displayed and one or only one is in the background. Another element was her book had the photo credits on the page with the photo. It looked, when you first look at, first think about the, the Marable book as if he doesn't have photo credits. In fact, he does, but they're on the copyright page. Um, so you, but it took me a while to even realize that that's where to go look for them. It would have been much better to have them present with the photos because her book says the name of the person, where they were published, that sort of thing. It's a very much better way of representing them. You might think, this is insignificant. No, for people who weren't around and, or were not 
present at his speeches, you get a much broader sense of who he is as a person once you look at those uh, photos, both in the Maryland book, but in particular since Thurlane Davis's book has more than 100. They're very, very powerful sets of photos. All right. Um, let me just, and then a few more comments and then I'll wrap. Um, I was looking at some of Karanga's comments about the, the Marable book. He quotes um, Marable, um, Marable extensively read history, but he was not a historian. Marable, Karanga attacks Marable for uh, saying about Malcolm that he wasn't a historian. Everybody's not an academic. But Marable detached that statement from the rest of the paragraph that, of Marable's, which is on page 408. Following that sentence, Marable says, his interpretation of enslavement in the U.S. casts black culture as utterly decimated by the, inst by the institution of slavery. And, um, and I can't read my writing. Thank you, Celine. Focused slavery's consequences in America as the very worst form of racist oppression. And as, in historical analysis, as historical analysis, this approach did not adequately measure the myriad forms of resistance uh, mounted by enslaved blacks. In other words, Marable is saying, um, is kind of criticizing Malcolm's earlier representation of, of the ways in which African Americans function in America and saying um, there's more to the ways in which African Americans dealt with and responded to slavery than that initial framework. Um, okay. So I, th I think I've already indicated that I found the book frustrating in some ways. Sources need more work. Um, I was curious as, as to how Marable selected the photographs and why he had such a limited number of them. Um, noted that he used some that were, had already been published by a number of, uh, by other scholars. Um, I found uh, he did uh, engage in, I would argue, um, the issue of judgment uh, that was referred to both by Kelly and also by um, Linda Murray. It seems to me that his, he does speculate, you know he's speculating, but there are times when that speculation you think, oh, where did that come from and how do you make that argument? It's, it's just not, you know, this is why he should be here to make, to engage in this kind of debate. Um, so the, I do think that there are some genuine bases for criticism of of the work and you can argue with a good portion of it. Let me change that. You can argue with some of it. Um, but as a um, volume, I think Marable's work puts Malcolm back where he should be among African Americans, working at understanding who he was, uh, where he came from, how he came to be, um, and realizing that the kinds of issues that he went through, the kinds of experiences he went through, despite all of those challenges, this was an extraordinarily brilliant, tremendously talented uh, leader. There are more people like him out there, and they are likely to follow. Um, let's look at what's happening uh, today, and let's look at what uh, Marable brings back and f challenges us with this view of Mer Malcolm X. I, I thank you. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you.